Today on Engine Power, engine dyno operation facts and functions, performance piston technology, how to strengthen your engine stand, what it takes to thoroughly clean your engine parts. Today on Engine Power, we're getting technical, and it's gonna be a little different than what you're used to seeing. Now we get to build a lot of cool projects in here, and you get to see those come together firsthand, step by step. But what you don't get to see are the little things we do to make our job just a little bit easier. Plus, we're gonna show you the construction and capabilities of pistons and what they're designed to be used for. We're also going to give you a full walkthrough of the most prominent piece of shop equipment we have, that tells the story of every engine we build. It all happens inside the specialized room where the bench racing stops and we test parts to see if they work so you don't have to. Also, it allows us to create dyno proven combinations that you can purchase at Summit Racing. We use engine stands in this shop just about every day. And if you plan on doing any type of engine work, this is one of the handiest tools to have around. Now a good engine stand will let you control, stabilize, and rotate just about any type of engine. And there are several different ones on the market. No matter which one you choose to purchase, there is always room for improvements to make it more sturdy and easier to use. Most stands are designed to ship in a flat box and require assembly. Now they are strong, but not rigid. Now what I mean by that is when you introduce the weight of the engine to the stand, they tend to wobble and lean to the left, right, or front. This one's rated to 750 pounds and assembles in about five minutes. Now it's time to customize the stand to get rid of all those issues. Here's how I like to do it. Start by removing the paint where the pieces come together. Now I'm using an 80 grit roll lock disc. The more removed, the cleaner and better looking the next step will be. Using our Miller Matic Auto Set 212, I'll run beads along the areas where I remove the paint. This process strengthens the stand by bonding the individual pieces together, forming a stronger structure. Even though this thing's rated at 750 pounds, additional support to the upright is always a good idea. Now I grab some pieces out of our scrap bin and this is how it goes. The brace is placed against the upright and the base. A few tacks are applied to keep it in place. Now weld the top and the bottom of the tube all the way around. To prevent the bare steel from rusting, a few coats of Duplicolor are applied. Now you know how to turn an economy stand into something a little more sturdy. And with all that movement eliminated, you get several benefits. The most important is the engine stays put during assembly so all your procedures and especially your torque values are accurate. This is the type of stand you see us use on a regular basis in here. Now it costs about three times more than the economy stand, but it has several more features. Like an eight-shaped design that uses four casters for a larger footprint, a thousand pound weight capacity, and a 360 degree swivel head with a crank handle to rotate the engine in any position. Sounds like the ultimate engine stand for 220 bucks, but like I mentioned earlier, little improvements can be made to make it a little easier to use. The handle makes it easy to turn manually, but with power tools, everything gets easier. Before we cover it back up, I'm placing a generous amount of grease on the gear set. This will prevent wear and binding after the modification. Using a cutoff disc, slice through the crank handle just behind the first bend. To properly demonstrate this modification, I'm loading a Chevy small block with iron heads onto it. Now proper rated hardware is just as important as the strength of the stand. Stay away from grade five. ARP offers bolt sets for engine stands. With that name, it's all the insurance I need. Our Matco battery operated drill is the power tool I hinted at earlier. We can attach it to the stub from the cutoff handle and place it on the low setting for high torque. Now sit back and check out the results. Little upgrades like these go a long way. Up next, it's Back to School with Pat for Piston 101, comparing the difference between cast, hyper-eutectic, and forged. Remember, no talking in class.
Pistons are one of the most talked about parts in an engine. In just about every bench race discussion between us gearheads, the piston comes up very early in the conversation. Its design and construction are key factors in not only how much power your engine will make, but how long it will make it for. Finding the correct piston for your application can be a bit confusing at first, but there are a few guidelines that you can go by to ensure that the slug that you buy will be the right one. We'll start by showing you three different types of pistons and how they differ in both material and construction. Each has their benefits and shortcomings depending on what you're putting together. First up is the regular old cast aluminum piston. The fancy technical name for it is autothermic. It's made by pouring molten aluminum into a mold and then it's finished machined to final size to its application. It's not pure aluminum, but an alloy that contains roughly 12.5% silicon. Around the pin bosses, steel inserts are cast in to control expansion of the piston skirt, allowing tight tolerances to be run for quietness. The wrist pin bore is also offset for the same reason. It keeps the piston from clattering on cold startup. The wrist pin is pressed into the rod and it floats in the pin bores. Cast pistons are designed for lower OEM power levels and are the cheapest to replace. So what does that mean to us hot rodders? Well, they're good to use up to about 400 horsepower. Next in line is a hyperutectic piston. Believe it or not, it's still an autothermic design by definition. It's made the exact same way as a cast piston. The big difference is the alloy used to make it. Hyperutectic pistons contain a higher amount of silicon content in the alloy mix, typically in the range of 16 to 19 percent. And that extra silicon has some advantages. The first, it slows the expansion rate of the piston down compared to the regular cast one. The second one, and more important one for us engine guys, it has a higher resistance to scuffing because of its higher heat tolerance. The higher heat is caused by higher horsepower, so the good news is a hyperutectic piston can survive in a higher output situation. Power levels, as much as 600 horsepower has been made with them successfully. The strongest and most durable piston is a forged one. It's made by taking a semi-solid casting of high strength aluminum alloy and forcing it over a die at extreme pressures to its rough shape. This process removes any porosity and tightens the grain structure to withstand the rigors of the higher temperatures and pressures associated with all forms of racing. It's finished machined to ultra high tolerances because of its molecular stability, and the wrist pins are retained in the piston with spiral locks, clips, or wire locks, and the connecting rod floats on the wrist pin. The two common alloys that are used in forged pistons are 4032 and 2618, and while they're both superior to cast aluminum, they differ in their capabilities. 4032 has 11% silicon content and expands less than 2618. There aren't any steel inserts in a forged piston because the thermal expansion is more predictable and controlled by the material itself and the piston's design. But the price of that is more clearance at ambient temp, resulting in slightly more skirt noise at cold startup. 4032 is an excellent choice for high performance street and racing applications where greater longevity and wear resistance is your requirement. The 2618 piston, like the one we use in our Bigfoot engine build, contains 2% or less silicon and is a more malleable material, able to withstand higher pressures, temps, and distortion without fracturing. It's also more resistant to high shock loads that happen from detonation. It's used for the highest horsepower applications, but the trade-off is that ambient clearances are slightly larger than its 4032 counterpart, resulting in more cold start skirt noise. And the piston softens easier due to its composition, so it wears out slightly faster. But for all-out racing abuse, where the pistons are regularly changed as a consumable part, it's the material to use hands down. No matter what you plan on driving or racing, there's a piston out there that fits both your application and your wallet. Your combination will determine what valve relief, dish, or dome you need on top, so careful planning is a must. But the end result is you'll have a piston that does exactly what it's supposed to and keeps you making the HP to keep your wheels turning. It's got to be clean to be mean. The ultimate cleaning process for your engine parts coming up. After teardown, but before assembly, a time-consuming but absolutely necessary process must be taken. We're talking about cleaning parts, and it doesn't matter if they're old and dirty and ready to go to the machine shop or brand new, we treat them all the same. 
Most new parts are shipped with a coating or rust inhibitor to protect them during their shelf life. Unfortunately, that attracts dirt and dust. And more importantly, the cardboard and other packing materials inside the box. There are several solvents you folks can use at home to clean parts with, like brake cleaner, carbon choke cleaner, and the one we use right before final assembly, lacquer thinner. Solvent tanks are a good start at a consumer level. It's a great investment that won't break the bank. This one is from Summit Racing for 150 bucks. This one from Safety Clean is the Cadillac for say. It's a recycling parts washer which distills dirty solvent back into clean solvent. This all happens internally. A big benefit of it is less fluid is changed and is more environmentally friendly. Inside the wash tub is a fluid supplied brush as well as a flexible fluid nozzle. The tub is large enough to handle crankshafts, cylinder heads, you get the idea. After the heavy dirt and grease are removed from the used parts, this is the next stop for them after the solvent tank. And it's the first stop for new parts out of the box. This is a jet washer from JRI Industries. To relate to you all at home, it's basically an industrial version of your dishwasher. Now inside is a carousel basket that's pretty heavy duty. Now this thing will handle everything from differentials to cylinder heads, even engine blocks. Basically, if it fits inside, this machine will clean it. These high pressure jets are positioned above and below the parts and sprays a safe water based detergent cleaner that's heated to 150 degrees. Older washers used a high alkaline caustic solution that was an environmental nightmare to get rid of, not to mention a health hazard. On the outside is the control panel. It houses the electric heater control where we can change the temperature. On the front, the on-off switches for the heater and the skimmer. It also has a timer that sets the length of runtime we want to clean the parts for. At the rear of the machine is a skimmer. Its job is to remove the grease and oil film off the top of the fluid in the holding tank and force it down this channel into a catch-all. Next up is a cleaning system that's used in all types of industries worldwide, from the medical, firearms, jewelry, all the way up to aerospace. It provides benefits that other cleaning systems cannot. It is expensive, but pays for itself by doing its job so well. Meet the Safety Clean Aqueous Ultrasonic Cleaner. LS rocker arms are loaded into this basket and dropped into the 35 by 23 by 12 tank. This fluid is also water-based and heated, just like the jet washer. The fluid is circulated via pumps through these filters and remove contaminants to keep the tank as clean as possible. The heart of the cleaning action are these 40 kilohertz Genesis ultrasonic generators. They introduce ultrasonic sound pulses into the cleaning tank, up to 40,000 of them per second. You can adjust the intensity from 15% to 100% depending on the parts you will be cleaning. These waves are strong enough to damage certain materials like engine bearings, so be careful what you put in and where the intensity is set. The pulses you see dancing across the water provide the cleaning action by traveling through the solution and colliding with the parts we put in. The control panel on this machine has several buttons, like a heater control, pump circulation, the on-off for the ultrasonic generators, a low liquid level indicator, plus a timer. Ultrasonic cleaners rise above other types because they can remove contaminants, whether large or small, better and faster than the others. A little known fact is they can be extremely dangerous, obviously from the heat. Burns suck, we all know, but worse than burns is death. Sonic waves have the capability of aerating your blood, causing air embolisms or air pockets in your bloodstream. Now those can block capillaries to your brain or other organs, shutting your lights out. Up next, how the engine dyno works. Our Superflow Dyno is what sets us apart from our competition. Now sure, we could show you new parts all day long, but what's the point without being able to show you what those parts are capable of? Now this is the most sophisticated piece of equipment in this entire building, and that's due to the amount of parameters it can measure and the complexity of how it does it. The twisting force an engine makes is called torque, and to measure it accurately, the dynamometer acts like a giant water break. The engine's crankshaft gets connected to the dyno's impeller housing. Water inside the housing creates resistance, making it hard to turn the crankshaft. This heats up the water and puts a serious load on the impeller housing as it literally tries to rotate off the dyno's frame. 
A force transducer bolted between the housing and the frame measures the rotational strain, which the computer translates into torque and horsepower. The hot water gets pumped back to the main storage tank to get reused. While most of the dyno's water is used to absorb torque, some of it regulates engine temperature. All of this makes for an accurate, efficient, and consistent dyno test system. In order for the data acquisition tower to receive pressures and temperatures and record them to PC, the engine has to be outfitted with the proper sensors. We'll start with the EGTs or exhaust gas temperatures. Bungs must be welded into the primary tube of the header you want to monitor. Standard practice is one at each cylinder. Individual cables plug into the data tower and are numbered per cylinder. Now the other ends of the cables, which house the pyrometers, go into their assigned bungs into the primaries. Here's what the EGT display looks like. Each line represents an individual cylinder. When the engine fires up, heat is monitored as it exits the exhaust ports and reported to the PC. This is used as a tuning tool when setting up a new engine. The PC also records all the data during a dyno run. This is what the recorded data looks like for each EGT. Now, as we can see, cylinder seven is the coldest, which most likely represents an uneven distribution issue with the manifold. This was just a start to get you more familiarized in how the dyno actually works. Now, in future dyno sessions, we'll include simple explanations just to get you up to speed on some of the other capabilities this awesome machine has. Dyno time is expensive no matter what you run, and this gives you insight and a little appreciation of what guys have to do when they dyno your bullet. Sessions start from around 500 bucks and go up, so be prepared, but it's well worth it so you don't get classified as a keyboard Rambo spouting numbers. You have proof. The 2015 Mustang is all new and better than ever, and so are the high performance parts hitting the aftermarket to go on them. Now this is Air Aid's new MXP cold air dam intake system. A newly designed roto molded air box replaces the factory piece that's known for having a lot of restrictions inside. Now the air inlet tube is designed using computer modeling to maintain proper mass airflow readings and calibrations. Now a new velocity stack is also included to help improve airflow even more. A premium filter and hardware make installation a breeze and you can pick your kit up at Summit Racing for under 350 bucks. It's inevitable that everything that we drive needs to be worked on at some point. When vehicles get up there in age, worn out parts will let you know they need a little attention by getting noisy. Case in point, accessory belt drives. When idlers and tensioners wear out and go south, they tend to make some racket. But the good news is they're relatively easy to replace. And even better news is Rock Auto has belt drive component kits specific for your application. They contain OEM quality tensioners, idlers, pulleys, and belts to get you back on the road quick and easy. And you can find your setup by logging on to rockauto.com. If your brake pedal doesn't feel as good as it did a few months back, and every time you apply it, you get that annoying squeaking sound, it's time for a brake job. This is EBC's Stage 4 kit for cars. Now it includes red stuff pads and full ceramic and USR slotted rotors. Now the pads are the lowest dust producing pads in EBC's line, and they're great for fast pavement pounders and muscle cars. The rotors are slotted for even pad wear, allowing you to change out the pads without having to have the rotors turned. Now the black Geomet finish resists corrosion and these things operate super quiet. Now to find your application or pricing, check out Summit Racing or your local auto parts store. That's it for engine power for this week. We'll see you next time.